Hi everyone, and welcome to the first Earth Science Review video for the Prologue Unit. In this video, I'll be going over my top 10 questions that I believe you should be able to do in order to do well on the Prologue Unit quiz. I believe this video will definitely help you out, but of course also use all of your notes and handouts in class to study from as well. So without further ado, here we go. Question number one. Which action can be performed most accurately using only the human senses? So you should know our five senses. So we got sight, we got hearing, we got touch, we got taste, and you got smell. So you want your answer to be something to do with one of those five senses. So for letter A, tearing a sheet of paper into squares whose sides measure one centimeter. We are not able to measure one centimeter with any of our senses. So we need a ruler or something for that. So this question, that, that answer is not going to work. B, adding 10 grams. Here we go again with this exact measurement. We cannot measure 10 grams with our five senses. You need a measurement tool to do that. C, measuring the air pressure of a room. There it is again with the measuring. We can't do that. But hey, look, we can count. So counting 28 shells from a beach is the best answer for this question. Number two, which statement about a major hurricane is an inference? So an inference is sort of like a prediction. So we want to find the answer choice that did not already happen. It might happen in the future. So for A, it says the wind speed of the hurricane is measured at 200 kilometers per hour. That right there is a fact. It already happened, so we don't want that one. B, the central air pressure is recorded at 946 millibars. That actually was recorded, so it already happened, so that's not a prediction or an inference. A rain gauge records three inches of rain in less than one hour. It already happened, so that's not a prediction or an inference. Damage from the storm is expected to be extensive. That means that it didn't happen yet, so this is our inference right there, letter D. Number three, a classification system is based on the use of what? Classification means to group. So you normally group them based on some type of physical characteristics. So like an example would be um, colors of stars. And in this case, it's sort of a dead giveaway because you have your keyword there. Classification means group. So letter C is going to be the right answer on this question. For A though, it says human senses to observe properties of objects. That's an observation. Inference, uh, sorry, instruments to observe properties of objects. Instruments don't have anything to do with a classification system. It has to do with something with grouping. So that's why letter C is going to be your best answer on that one. Number four. So we got a little math problem here. It says base your answer to the following question on the image provided below. So we got our cube, and it says. If each side of the cube, shown above, has the same length as the measured side, what is the approximate volume of the cube? So for this, you got to know volume equals length times width times height. So for a cube, the length, width, and height are all the same. So we're just going to multiply it across. Now we notice we're in centimeters, so that's going to be our unit. So that's important. And in this case, we have one centimeter, two centimeter, and then the line is right here, if you look really closely. That's two little lines, or millimeters, after the two centimeter line. So we don't write it two centimeters and two millimeters. We use decimal points. So it would be two centimeters, point, one, two. 2 millimeters. So there, 2.2 .2 centimeters is one side, that, but that's only one side. So we got to do 2.2 .2 centimeters times 2.2 .2 centimeters times 2.2 .2 centimeters. So if you throw that in your calculator, which I will do now, obviously don't forget your calculator, you're going to get letter D, 10.65. Whoops, 10. Point six five centimeters cubed and the reason it's centimeters cubed is because we did centimeters times centimeters times centimeters so that's why it's cubed 
Number five, the data table below shows the mass and volume of three samples of the same mineral. So that's important. It says the density column is provided for student use. Great, so we got our sample A, B, C, our mass of 50, 100, and 150, and our volume of 25, 50, and 75. So it says, which graph best represents the relationship between the density and the volume of these mineral samples? Well, to do that, we're going to have to find the density to fill in that column because it asked us about that. So in order to do that, the formula is actually on the front of your refer reference table, but it's density equals mass divided by the volume. So in this case, here's our mass right here, and here's our volume. So for the first density, it's going to be, so A, it's going to be 50 grams divided by 25 centimeters cubed. And you might be able to do that in your head, but the answer is going to be 2 grams per centimeters cubed. For B, it's 100 grams divided by 50 centimeters cubed. So guess what? That's 2 grams per centimeters cubed. And finally, if you didn't catch on to the pattern, 150 divided by 75 is another 2 centimeters cubed. So clearly what happens is the volume is going up as you go A, B, C, but the density is staying the same. It's 2, 2, 2. So let's look at these four graphs now. We want to find the graph that shows that. This graph shows as the volume is this, the density just continues to go up. This graph is completely incorrect. This doesn't mean anything for what we, what we need. This one shows, and if you put little marks here, you can help yourself. So that here's one through five, and one, two, three, four, five. One, five, one, five. Watch this, ready? When the volume is one, the density is one. When the volume is two, the density is two. When the volume is three, the density is three. See how I'm doing that? All the data is on the line. None of this air, extra area here matters. It's only the line. Four is four. So this is as volume goes up, density goes up as well. That's not what's happening in here. We need the density to stay the same. Same with this one. This is an inverse relationship right here. This is a direct relationship right here. So for an inverse, as one goes up, the other is going down. For direct, as one goes up, the other goes up. And finally, this is our answer right here, letter D, because the volume is going up, one, two, three, four, five, but the density, in my case, I just made this up, but it's always like one, it's three, at two, it's three, at three, it's three. So as volume goes up, density is not changing, which is what's happening in our, our little example here. So D is going to be your best answer here. Number six, if a parcel of air is heated, what happens to its density? So here's the trick for this. So you got two situations here. So you got one, two, three, four. So say this is like cool air, and then you heat it. If I were to ask you, are these molecules packed in box A, you would probably say yes. So since it's packed, Together, the density is higher, because density means the more packed it is, the more the dense it is. So now if you heat it up, what happens is the molecules start to spread out. So it's going to look like this. So this is less packed, which means it's warm air, because we just heated it. So since it's less packed, density is going to drop. This is really important. So as you heat something up, density drops. Number seven, base your answer to the following question on the diagram and table below. Please make sure you're reading this top area, even if you don't think you, you want to skip to the question. This might give you some useful information. So just get into the habit of reading that top area. Under identical conditions, several samples of the mineral pyrite, so mineral pyrite, that's important, are measured. Their densities are compared. The values obtained should show that what? Okay, here's the big concept, ready? As the amount of an object increases, the density stays the same. So any object, in this case pyrite, no matter how much pyrite you have, 
it's going to be the same density. No matter how much quartz you have, it's going to be the same density. No matter how much fluorite you have, it's going to be the same density. So letter D right here, all pyrite samples have the same density because it's pyrite, and pyrite has a certain density. So no matter what, density stays the same as long as it's the same material. Going on to question eight. Compared to the density of liquid water, so water is weird, the density of an ice cube will be what? So if you remember this summer and you were outside with your glass of lemonade, you might have noticed if you put ice cubes in your lemonade, they tend to float. And it's because water is most dense as a liquid. Normally it's more dense, everything's more dense as a solid, but water is really weird. So you got to know this about water. So compared to the density of water, the density of an ice cube, since it floats, is going to be less dense than liquid water. So and a fun fact on your reference table, it's going to be most dense at 3.98 degrees Celsius in liquid. So that's on the front of your reference table if they ever ask you about 3.98 degrees Celsius. Number nine. The graph below shows the relationship between the mass and volume of a mineral. They want to know what the density is, but they give you a graph. So before I didn't actually show this to you, this is the DMV triangle. So essentially if you want to find mass here, you cover the letter M and the formula is density times volume. So if you want to find you got to write the letters right or it's not going to work though. If you want to find density, you cover the letter D and it's mass divided by volume. If you want to find volume, you cover the letter V and it's mass divided by density. So you could find all density, mass, and volume interchangeably if you remember that little triangle. So it says, what is the density of the mineral? Well, to solve for density, you need a mass and a volume. And look at this. It just so happens that this graph shows volume and mass. But look, it's a line. How are you supposed to figure that out? Well, here's my advice to you. Find a spot on the line where the line perfectly intersects two uh, joining lines, like this spot here, this spot here, this spot here, this spot here. I'm going to pick this spot right here. So at that spot, the volume is 3 and the mass is 18. So that's the numbers I'm going to use. Ready? 18 grams for the mass divided by the volume, which I said was 3. So if you divide that, you're going to get 6 grams per centimeters cubed. Now check this out. Say that I picked a different spot. So it seems that these go up by threes. So let's pick here. Say I just happened to pick that spot. Now the volume is one and the mass is six. So say I did six grams divided by one centimeters cubed. Well look at that. It's still six grams per centimeters cubed. So as long as you pick a dot on the line, no matter which dot you pick, it's going to give you the right answer. I just try to pick the dots that are the easiest to divide. Like I knew 3 and 18 because that, that 3 goes into 18. Number 10, an empty 250 milliliter beaker, so this is an empty 250 milliliter beaker right here, has a mass of 60 grams. So it's got nothing in it and it weighs 60 grams. When 100 milliliters of oil is added to it, so we got 100 milliliters of oil now into that. Now its total mass is 140 grams. They want to know the density of just the oil. So this is a little tricky. So for the oil, in order to get the density, I need the mass of the oil and the volume of the oil, right? Well, how much oil did I use? I used 100 milliliters of oil, so there's my volume. But the mass is weird. How am I supposed to weigh the oil? They didn't tell me that. But they did tell me what the beaker weighed before the oil and after the oil. So that's the key. So what you're going to end up having to do is subtract 140 grams minus 60 grams. And that gives you 80 grams. So that's how much the oil weighs. Because that was the change in mass after you poured the oil in the beaker. So now if you do 80 grams divided by 100 milliliters and you put that in your calculator, you get this nice number here, 0.8 grams per milliliter as your answer. So this one I would say is the hardest density problem you could probably get. Now I know I said this, I'm going to give you the top 10 questions, but guess what? 
a little bonus question that you're going to need to know how to do. So number 11 here, the last one, this is a graph and it says the graph below shows temperature readings for a day in April. It says the average rate of temperature change, remember rate of change, this is on page one of your reference table, the formula. So we got rate of change equals change in value over time. So it says they want degrees per hour between 6 a.m. and noon. Watch this. So here's 6 a.m. to noon. Let's count how many hours that is. Ready? One hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five hour, six hours. So that's how much time passed. And now we need to know how much the temperature changed. So we're going to use the chart. So ready? Here's 6 a.m. right here to noon, and they even put dots there for you. So at 6 a.m. it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to put that 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And at 12 p.m. it got up to, it looks like, I don't know, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. So your number on top should be positive, so that's why I put the 48 before the 30. So if you do 48 minus 30 on the top, you're going to get, I'm going to do this over here, you're going to get 18 degrees Fahrenheit divided by six hours, and that works out nicely. Three degrees Fahrenheit change per one hour. And is that an answer choice? It is. So there you go for C. So those are my top 10 plus bonus plus one question um, recommendation on the best questions to know for the quiz. Obviously, if you have any questions, you can let me know. Other than that, good luck on the quiz, and I hope you found this helpful.